The Mafia has been a source of intrigue for the longest, so much so that it has influenced some of pop culture's most significant moments, from The Sopranos to The Godfather. They're seen as these dangerous and complicated men full of mystery. When you're a made guy, you're not in fear of any one guy, because everybody that took that oath is capable of doing damage. That's why it's not surprising that these celebrities have found themselves tangled in the web of these made men. So without further ado, here are six-time celebrities messed with the wrong mafia, the mob and Steven Seagal. Siegel, the renowned action movie star, is not just a tough guy on the silver screen. He possesses real martial arts skills that have contributed to his success and reputation. Seagal is a 7th Dan black belt in Aikido, a Japanese martial art known for its emphasis on redirecting an opponent's energy. But before he made it big in Hollywood, Siegel dedicated his early adult life to teaching martial arts in Japan. Born on April 10, 1952 in Lansing, Michigan, Siegel's fascination with martial arts began at a young age. He started studying Aikido in his teenage years, and eventually traveled to Japan to further his training. There, he became the first foreigner to operate an Aikido dojo in Osaka. Siegel's dedication and talent earned him the respect of his peers and instructors, and he quickly rose through the ranks. Siegel's martial arts expertise caught the attention of Hollywood producers, who saw the potential for a unique action star. In 1988, he made his film debut in Above the Law, where he showcased his Aikido skills on the big screen. The movie was a success, and Siegel's career in Hollywood took off. Siegel's breakthrough role came in 19. 1992 with the release of Under Siege. The film, set aboard the USS Missouri, showcased his versatility as an actor and martial artist. Playing the role of Casey Ryback, a former Navy SEAL turned cook, Siegel's character had to use his combat skills to save the ship from terrorists. Under Siege became a box office hit and further cemented Siegel's status as a leading action star. However, despite his success in the martial arts world and his rising star in Hollywood, Siegel's career decisions in the film industry were not always wise. One of his biggest producers, Julia R. Nasso played a significant role in shaping Seagal's early career. Nasso produced several of Seagal's popular films, including Marked for Death, Fire Down Below, and the aforementioned Under Siege sequels. But their partnership eventually turned sour, leading to a series of legal disputes. Nasso claimed that Seagal broke a $60 million deal for four more films, which caused tension between the two. This strained relationship would later have unexpected and dangerous consequences for Seagal. Little did Seagal know that Nasso had connections to the Gambino crime family, one of New York's notorious mafia families. Seeking retribution for the broken deal, Nasso called upon a Gambino family associate to confront Siegel. The action movie star had no idea that the mob was out for justice until he was forcibly abducted in Brooklyn in 2001. The mob's involvement in his kidnapping was a chilling revelation, and Siegel found himself in a life-or-death situation. The events that unfolded would test his resilience and force him to make difficult choices. At the time, federal authorities were already investigating mob activities on New York's waterfront, which involved Peter Gotti, the brother of infamous mafia boss John Gotti, and the head of the Gambino family. As part of their investigation, the FBI discovered wiretaps that corroborated Siegel's claims. These wiretaps revealed conversations among mob enforcers discussing plans to shake down Siegel and making references to his movies. While Nasso vehemently denied any association with the Gambino family, the evidence presented a different story. The mafiosi involved in Siegel's kidnapping were none other than Richard Bondi, Anthony Sonny Ciccone, and Primo Casarino, notorious capos and street soldiers from the Gambino family. Their involvement further highlighted the seriousness of the situation and the dangerous world Siegel had unwittingly stepped into. To make matters even more perilous, Casarino and Ciccone accompanied Nasso on a visit to Siegel's Los Angeles home. The actor knew he was on deadly ground, facing the very individuals who had orchestrated his abduction. It was a tense and potentially life-threatening situation. However, instead of seeking revenge and resorting to violence, Siegel made a surprising decision. He chose to cooperate with the authorities turning to the FBI for help. With the FBI wiretaps as crucial evidence, Siegel's cooperation played a pivotal role in the investigation. The wiretaps provided undeniable proof of the mob's involvement and their intentions to extort and intimidate the action movie star. Siegel's decision to trust the authorities and provide valuable information ultimately led to a guilty plea from Nasso. In 2003, Nasso was sentenced to a year in prison on extortion and conspiracy charges. The legal repercussions of his actions were severe, and he was also ordered to to pay a $75,000 fine. Siegel's cooperation and the evidence gathered from the FBI wiretaps had brought down his former producer, putting an end to the dangerous game that had unfolded. The aftermath of these events had a profound impact on Siegel's career. While he continued to make action movies, his releases shifted to the direct-to-video market. Despite the setbacks, Siegel's martial arts skills and on-screen presence still captivated audiences. His dedication to his craft remained unwavering, and he continued to pursue his passion for acting and martial arts. In addition to 
his film career, Siegel embarked on a new chapter by training foreign special operators. His expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat and his reputation as a martial arts master made him a sought-after instructor. Siegel's commitment to sharing his knowledge and skills with others showcased his resilience and determination to overcome the challenges he had faced. Despite the controversies and challenges he faced, Siegel continued to pursue his passion for martial arts and acting. He went on to make a series of direct-to-video action movies, averaging about two releases per year since 2003. Additionally, he expanded his horizons by training foreign special operators and even became a Russian citizen, solidifying his ties to the country. Jimi Hendrix and the Mafia Hendrix, renowned for his soul-stirring vocals and mesmerizing guitar skills, led a life filled with outrageous antics fueled by mind-altering substances. But amidst the chaos, there's a lesser-known incident that will leave you astounded. Picture this, a kidnapping attempt, the scary world of the mafia, and an unexpected hero. As Jimi Hendrix's music career began to take off, he found himself propelled into the spotlight and surrounded by influential figures in the industry. One such individual was Chaz Chandler, the former bassist of The Animals, who would become Hendrix's manager and play a a pivotal role in shaping his rise to fame. Chandler first encountered Hendrix during a performance at Café Wa in Greenwich Village. Mesmerized by Hendrix's raw talent and electrifying stage presence, Chandler recognized the potential for greatness. He approached Hendrix after the show and proposed a life-changing opportunity to move to London and form a band that would showcase his extraordinary skills to the world. Hendrix, intrigued by the offer, decided to take a leap of faith and accepted Chandler's proposition. Together, they formed the Jimi Hendrix Experience with Chandler serving as both manager and mentor to the budding rock star. The band consisted of Hendrix on guitar and vocals, Noel Redding on bass, and Mitch Mitchell on drums. Under Chandler's guidance, the Jimi Hendrix experience quickly gained traction in the British music scene. Their unique blend of psychedelic rock, blues, and soul-captivated audiences and set them apart from their contemporaries. Hendrix's virtuosic guitar playing, combined with his soulful voice and charismatic stage presence, made him an instant sensation. Chandler's industry connections and strategic decision-making played a crucial role in propelling the band to success. He secured a record deal with Track Records, which led to the release of their debut album, Are You Experienced, in 1967. The album was a groundbreaking masterpiece that showcased Hendrix's innovative guitar techniques and experimental soundscapes. With hits like Hey Joe, Purple Haze, and The Wind Cries, Mary, the Jimi Hendrix experience became a sensation both in the UK and across the Atlantic. Their music resonated with a generation hungry for something new and revolutionary. Hendrix's mesmerizing performances, often accompanied by his signature guitar theatrics, left audiences in awe and solidified his status as a guitar virtuoso. Chandler's astute management skills ensured that the band received ample exposure through extensive touring and high-profile appearances. They performed at iconic venues, such as the Monterey Pop Festival and the Woodstock Music and Art Fair, solidifying their place in music history. However, the pressures of fame and the constant demands of the music industry took a toll on Hendrix. His experimentation with drugs and his his tumultuous personal life began to overshadow his musical achievements. Despite the challenges, Chandler remained a steadfast supporter and continued to guide Hendrix through the highs and lows of his career. Amidst Jimi Hendrix's meteoric rise to fame, he found himself entangled in a harrowing ordeal involving a kidnapping attempt orchestrated by the Mafia. This shocking incident, which took place in the late 1960s, nearly derailed Hendrix's career and left a lasting impact on his life. The story begins with Hendrix's association with John Roberts, a former mafia member and convicted cocaine trafficker. Roberts, who owned a prominent New York nightclub called Salvation, had crossed paths with Hendrix through their mutual connections in the music industry. While they were not close friends, Hendrix occasionally sought refuge at Roberts's house on Fire Island, where he could escape the suffocating presence of his entourage and find solace in the company of true friends. During one of these visits, Roberts and Hendrix bonded over their shared love for music and embarked on a few memorable adventures together. One such escapade involved water skiing off the back of Robert's Donzi boat. Despite Hendrix's penchant for drugs, he enjoyed engaging in physical activities, even while under the influence. However, this particular outing would prove to be a near-fatal mistake. As the boat sped across the water, Hendrix, without a life vest, attempted to maintain his balance on the skis, but his drug-induced state impaired his coordination, and he soon found himself plunging into the water. Panic ensued as Hendrix thrashed about, struggling to stay afloat. Roberts, realizing the gravity of the situation, swiftly maneuvered the boat and tossed a rope to Hendrix, who was desperately 
excitedly waving his arms. In a moment of sheer relief, Andy Benfante, Robert's mafia partner, leaped into the water and swam the rope over to Hendrix. The potential tragedy was averted, but not for long. Little did Hendrix know that his association with Roberts and the mafia would soon thrust him into a far more perilous situation. It all began when Hendrix was abducted by two Italian individuals who frequented Roberts' club. These individuals, not affiliated with the mafia, but aspiring to be wise guys, saw an opportunity to exploit Hendrix's fame and demand a ransom. Under the guise of offering Hendrix drugs, the kidnappers lured him to a house outside the city. Once there, they contacted Hendrix's manager, demanding either money or a share of his record contract. News of the abduction quickly reached Roberts, who was determined to rescue his acquaintance from the clutches of these misguided individuals. Roberts and Benfante swiftly took action, making it clear to the kidnappers that harming Hendrix would have dire consequences. With their mafia connections and reputation for brutality, they instilled fear in the hearts of the captors. Within a matter of days, Hendrix was released unharmed, his memory of the ordeal likely clouded by the drugs that perpetually coursed through his veins. While Roberts and Benfante were hailed as heroes for their intervention, the aftermath of the kidnapping had far-reaching consequences. Hendrix's inner circle, fearing for his safety, contacted the FBI, which subsequently launched an investigation into the incident. This scrutiny would later lead to the FBI linking Roberts and Benfante to the murder of Robert Wood, a development that forced Roberts to flee New York for Miami. Ironically, it was this act of saving Jimi Hendrix from a kidnapping that inadvertently set Roberts on a path that would ultimately lead him to the infamous Medellin cartel and its notorious leader, Pablo Escobar. Roberts' involvement in the cocaine smuggling business in Miami was a direct result of the events surrounding Hendrix's abduction. The kidnapping attempt on Jimi Hendrix shows the high adrenaline nature of Hendrix's existence, where his addiction to drugs and the constant pursuit of his next high exposed him to dangerous situations. While Roberts and Benfante were able to rescue Hendrix from this particular ordeal, they were unable to shield him from the tragic fate that awaited him. Edward James Olmos and the Mexican Mafia Edward James Olmos, a renowned actor known for his powerful performances, has had a fascinating journey intertwined with the dangerous world of the Mexican Mafia. When Edward James Olmos received the script for American Me, he was excited to bring to life the world of the Mexican Mafia, a world he knew intimately. However, as he delved into the pages, he quickly discovered glaring discrepancies between the script and the real-life experiences of individuals involved with the Mexican Mafia. One of the major inaccuracies in the script was the portrayal of Montoyo Santana's mother being raped by sailors during the Zoot Suit riots, leaving her uncertain about Montoya's true father. This event, depicted in the opening scene, was utterly untrue. Olmos's character was based on Rodolfo Cadena, also known as Cheyenne, a real-life member of the Mexican Mafia. Cheyenne's mother was not a victim of such a traumatic incident, and the script's portrayal of this event distorted the truth. Furthermore, the script includes a shocking scene in which Santana experiences a violent incident in the juvenile hall. The specifics of this incident are not mentioned due to to their sensitive nature, but it is important to note that it was a fabrication. Cheyenne, the real-life inspiration for Olmos's character, had never experienced such abuse. In reality, the idea that someone who had been violated in such a way could rise to the top of a prison gang is highly unlikely. Another significant concern was the script's use of the name La Im to refer to the Mexican Mafia. While this is the actual name of the gang, it raised red flags for Olmos and those familiar with the inner workings of the Mexican Mafia. The use of this name without proper approval from the gang's leaders, such as Joe Morgan, could have serious consequences. Almost knew just how serious and deadly the Mexican Mafia was, having come into contact with its members during his time in prison. The script's portrayal of the gang's activities and dynamics could potentially misrepresent their world, leading to dissatisfaction and even danger. As a high-profile Chicano who had done time, Olmos understood the importance of accurately representing the experiences and lives of those involved with the Mexican Mafia. He knew that any movie about the gang would need a approval from the OGs in prison, and their opinion carried significant weight. Before committing to the project, Olmos was determined to find out what the shot callers thought about it, ensuring that their voices were heard and their stories were respected. He arranged a meeting to discuss the script with the Mexican Mafia, a meeting that would prove to be both intriguing and potentially dangerous. The meeting took place at Jerry's famous deli in Encino, and Olmos was accompanied by his agent. To ensure his safety and to gain insight from someone who understood the world of the Mexican Mafia, Olmos invited his friend 
friend Eddie Bunker, a screenwriter who had also served time in prison. Suddenly, Eddie Bunker glanced up and whispered, they're here. Almost turned around and saw the Mexican mafia representatives entering the deli. The weight of the situation hung heavy as they approached the table. Edward James Olmos, dressed in full cholo attire, greeted them with an orale ace que onda. His appearance, mimicking the style of a gang member, was a stark contrast to the casual businessmen attire of Olmos's companions. The Mexican mafia representatives, including Joe Morgan, the current head of the Mexican mafia, took their seats. The atmosphere was tense as everyone knew the gravity of the situation. The discussion began and almost wasted no time in getting straight to the point. He asked the representatives if they had been consulted about the film and if they had given their approval. Eddie Bunker, ever vigilant, raised the question that was on everyone's mind. Olmos's response was immediate, but it raised a red flag. He claimed to have met with Joe and received his approval. However, there was a subtle shift in his demeanor, a hint of deflection and deception that did not go unnoticed. Olmos's response left doubts lingering in the air, and it became clear that he may not have been completely honest about his conversation with Joe Morgan. The meeting continued, but the tension remained. Olmos and his companions listened intently as the Mexican Mafia representatives voiced their concerns and opinions. The weight of their experiences and the potential consequences of misrepresenting their world hung heavy in the room. As the meeting progressed, it became evident that the Mexican Mafia representatives were not pleased with the script's inaccuracies and liberties. They understood the power of storytelling and the impact it could have on their reputation and the lives of those involved with the gang. Edward James Olmos, realizing the gravity of the situation, listened attentively and took note of their concerns. He understood the importance of accurately representing the experiences and lives of those involved with the Mexican Mafia. This meeting served as a wake-up call, a reminder that the story being told had real-life implications and consequences. As the meeting drew to a close, tensions eased slightly. Despite the initial doubts and concerns, there was a glimmer of hope that the project could be salvaged. Olmos and his companions left the deli, their minds filled with the weight of the discussion and the responsibility they carried. Misrepresenting the Mexican Mafia, a powerful and deadly organization, could have severe repercussions. The gang's leaders, such as Joe Morgan, held significant influence and control within the prison system. Their approval and support were crucial for any movie about the Mexican Mafia to gain credibility and avoid backlash. As the project moved forward, almost faced the challenge of reworking the script to align with the feedback received from the Mexican Mafia representatives. It required careful revisions and a commitment to authenticity. He sought to create a narrative that not only entertained, but also shed light on the complexities and realities of the Mexican Mafia, Jackie Chan, and the Chinese triads. As Jackie Chan's fame grew, so did the threats against him from the Chinese triads. This was because he had crossed them in the past. Seeking refuge in the United States seemed like the safest option, but little did he know that danger would follow him across the ocean. Unbeknownst to Jackie, the triads had been monitoring his every move. They saw his escape to the United States as a challenge to their authority and were determined to make him pay. Armed with weapons and a thirst for revenge, they lay in wait for him at the airport. As Jackie made his way through the bustling terminal, he couldn't shake off the feeling that something was amiss. Little did he know that danger lurked just around the corner. Suddenly, gunshots rang out, shattering the air and sending panic rippling through the crowd. The triads had opened fire on him, their bullets narrowly missing their target. In a split second, Jackie's instincts kicked in. He ducked for cover, his heart pounding in his chest. The chaos around him was overwhelming, but he knew he had to stay calm and find a way to escape. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, he made a daring dash toward the nearest exit, dodging bullets and debris along the way. Outside the airport, Jackie found temporary refuge in a nearby alley. He caught his breath, his mind racing with thoughts of what had just transpired. It was clear to him that the triads would stop at nothing to eliminate him. He realized that if he wanted to survive, he needed to take drastic measures to protect himself. From that moment on, Jackie made the decision to carry a gun every day when he went out. It was a necessary precaution, a means of self-defense in a world where danger lurked around every corner. The triads had shown their willingness to use violence, and Jackie was determined not to become their next victim. But carrying a gun was not with Without its challenges, Jackie had to navigate the complex web of gun laws and regulations in the United States. He sought out trusted contacts who could provide him with the necessary firearms, ensuring that he had the means to protect himself at all times. The triads, however, were relentless in their pursuit. They continued to hound Jackie, making his life a living nightmare. They would send threatening messages, warning him of the consequences if he didn't comply with their demands. But Jackie refused to be intimidated. He knew that giving in to their threats would only embolden them further. Jackie Chan's 
encounters with the Chinese triads were not limited to the streets or the shadows. In one shocking incident, he found himself face to face with danger in the most unexpected of places, a dinner. It was a seemingly ordinary evening, with Jackie enjoying a meal at a restaurant, unaware of the imminent threat that awaited him. As he savored each bite, Jackie noticed a shift in the atmosphere. The once lively chatter around him grew hushed, and a sense of tension filled the air. It was then that he realized he was being watched. Glancing around discreetly, he spotted them, 20 gang members armed with menacing machetes surrounding his table. At that moment, time seemed to stand still. Jackie's heart raced as he assessed the situation. He knew he had to act quickly if he wanted to survive this encounter. With nerves of steel, he reached for his concealed gun, ready to defend himself against the impending danger. As the gang members closed in, their eyes filled with malice. Jackie's voice boomed with authority. He warned them that they had gone too far, that he had been hiding from them for far too long. It was a bold move, a declaration that he would no longer be their prey. With his gun in hand, Jackie stood his ground, his eyes locked with those of his adversaries. The tension in the room was palpable as everyone held their breath, waiting for the inevitable clash. But Jackie had a surprise up his sleeve, or rather, concealed within his jacket. In a swift motion, he revealed not just one, but two more guns. The gang members were taken aback, their confidence waning as they realized the gravity of the situation. Jackie's determination and unwavering resolve sent a clear message. He would not be intimidated, but Jackie's arsenal didn't end there. In a shocking twist, he revealed that he also had six grenades at his disposal. The room fell into a stunned silence as the gang members processed the gravity of their predicament. Jackie's calculated move had turned the tables, giving him the upper hand in this deadly game of cat and mouse. With the odds now in his favor, Jackie issued a final warning to the gang members. He made it clear that their reign of terror had come to an end and that he would no longer be their target. It was a powerful moment, a testament to Jackie's resilience and unwavering spirit. The gang members, faced with the reality of their impending defeat, slowly backed away. They had underestimated Jackie's determination and resolve, and now they had to face the consequences. In that moment, Jackie emerged as a true hero, a force to be reckoned with. The exact details of when this confrontation took place remain a mystery, as Jackie did not elaborate on the specific timeline. However, the impact of this on counter on his life and his resolve to stand up against the triads cannot be denied. It was a turning point, a moment that solidified Jackie's determination to protect himself and those he cared about at all costs. Al Sharpton in the 1980s, the Reverend Al Sharpton, a prominent civil rights activist, found himself entangled in a web of shocking allegations. According to a report by The Smoking Gun, Sharpton was accused of being a key informant for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. The report claimed that Sharpton worked closely with a joint FBI-NYPD crime task force, gathering crucial information on New York City's most notorious mobsters. It alleged that he engaged in conversations with these mobsters while wearing a wire, which ultimately led to the bugging of various locations and phone lines. The information collected during these operations was said to have been instrumental in the fight against organized crime. However, Sharpton vehemently denies these allegations. He maintains that he was not an informant, but rather a cooperative individual who was working with the FBI to ensure his own safety. Sharpton admits to collaborating with the FBI for a period of two years, but he insists that his intentions were solely focused on protecting himself from the dangerous world of the mafia. According to Sharpton, his involvement with the FBI began after he received death threats from members of the infamous Gambino family. Fearing for his life, he reached out to the authorities and offered his assistance in any way possible. Sharpton claims that he was willing to do whatever it took to ensure his safety and the safety of those around him. Despite his denials, the allegations against Sharpton have raised eyebrows and sparked intense debate. Some argue that his collaboration with law enforcement was a necessary step in the fight against organized crime, while others question his motives and the extent of his involvement. Critics argue that Sharpton's close association with the FBI raises questions about his credibility as a civil rights leader. They claim that his alleged role as an IE informant compromises his ability to advocate for justice and equality as it suggests a level of cooperation with law enforcement that may be seen as contradictory to his activism. On the other hand, supporters of Sharpton argue that his actions were justified given the threats he faced. They believe that his collaboration with the FBI was a necessary measure to protect himself and others from the dangerous world of organized crime. They argue that Sharpton's willingness to work with law law enforcement demonstrates his commitment to ensuring his own safety and the safety of those around him. During these undercover encounters, Sharpton reportedly discussed a wide range of topics with the mobsters. He delved into their criminal activities, their connections, and their plans. The conversations revealed the inner workings of the mafia, exposing their strategies, and providing crucial information to law enforcement. Following his collaboration with the FBI and the shocking allegations surrounding his involvement with the mafia, Al Sharpton's life took a dramatic turn. The aftermath of the 
these events had a profound impact on his personal life, his activism, and his public reputation. First and foremost, Sharpton faced intense scrutiny and criticism from both his detractors and some within the civil rights community. Many questioned his credibility as a civil rights leader, arguing that his collaboration with law enforcement compromised his ability to advocate for justice and equality. Some accused him of betraying the very principles he had fought for throughout his career. Despite the backlash, Sharpton remained steadfast in his defense. He maintained that his collaboration with the FBI was a necessary measure to protect himself from death threats and to ensure the safety of those around him. He argued that his actions were motivated by a desire for self-preservation and a commitment to fighting against organized crime. In the years that followed, Sharpton continued his activism work, albeit under a cloud of controversy. He faced challenges in rebuilding his reputation and regaining the trust of those who questioned his motives. However, he remained committed to his mission of advocating for justice and equality, using his platform to address issues of systemic racism and social injustice. Sammy Davis Jr. Next, we'll explore Sammy Davis Jr.'s life and his relationship with a star that led to a chilling mob threat on his life. As we step back in, time to the late 1950s, the glitz and glamour of Hollywood were at their peak. It was during this era that Sammy Davis Jr., the charismatic entertainer on the rise, and Kim Novak, the stunning actress about to star in her biggest movie, Vertigo, found themselves crossing paths. Depending on who you ask, their connection was either the start of a passionate affair or a close friendship shrouded in secrecy. According to Vanity Fair, it was Tony Curtis, another prominent figure in the entertainment industry who played matchmaker and introduced Davis and Novak to each other. Both individuals were intrigued by the prospect of getting to know one another, and their initial meeting set the stage for a relationship that would soon become the talk of the town. However, Novak has a different recollection of their first encounter. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, she revealed that Davis approached her with a unique proposition, a photography session. Intrigued by the idea, Novak agreed, and little did she know that this would be the beginning of a journey filled with twists and turns. Their paths would cross once again at a party hosted by Tony Curtis at his lavish home. It was at this gathering that Novak believed she was drugged, leading to a hazy memory of the events that unfolded that night. The details may be shrouded in mystery, but one thing is certain. This meeting would set in motion a series of events that would forever change the lives of both Sammy Davis Jr. and Kim Novak. As the relationship between Sammy Davis Jr. and Kim Novak continued to develop behind closed doors, the tabloids couldn't resist the allure of a scandalous story. Despite Novak's insistence, that they were only friends, rumors about their romantic involvement began to circulate, capturing the attention of the public. However, amidst the swirling gossip, Novak remained steadfast in her stance that she and Davis were nothing more than friends. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, she explained, I knew Sammy had this crush and I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but Novak's reluctance to confirm their romantic involvement only added to the intrigue surrounding their relationship, leaving the public to speculate and form their own opinions. However, behind the scenes of the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, a dark and dangerous force was lurking. According to Vanity Fair, the mob took notice of Davis's association with the actress and saw it as a threat to their own interests. The article reports that Mickey Cohen, a notorious gangster, approached Davis's father, Sammy Davis Sr., with a chilling ultimatum. Cohen revealed that he had received a call from Chicago instructing him to harm Sammy Jr. The only way to protect his son was for Sammy Jr. to get married to a colored girl. The threat was clear. If Davis didn't comply, his life would be in grave danger. The source of this threat could be traced back to another powerful figure in Hollywood, Cohn. As the article explains, Cohn was heavily invested in Novak's success and didn't want her bank ability to be tarnished by her association with a black man, even one as beloved and talented as Davis. Feeling trapped and fearing for his life, Davis made a difficult decision. He quickly married Lorraine White, a singer he already knew, in order to appease the mob and protect himself from their wrath. Meanwhile, Novak, upon learning of the threats, made the heartbreaking choice to distance herself from Davis. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, she revealed, that's when I, for his sake, thought I'd better not see him. The consequences of their relationship were not only a threat to their lives, but also to their careers and personal well-being. The story of Sammy Davis Jr.'s mob threat serves as a reminder of the power and influence wielded by organized crime in the entertainment industry during that era, and that racism permeates the fabric of society. For Davis, the marriage to White was a strategic move to appease the mob and protect his own life. However, the decision came at a great personal cost. The marriage was 
marriage was not built on love, but rather on the desperate need for self-preservation. Davis had to navigate the complexities of a marriage that was born out of fear and coercion, which undoubtedly took a toll on his emotional well-being. Despite the passage of time and the changes in their personal lives, Davis and Novak still held a special place for each other. Reportedly, Novak visited Davis in the hospital when he was on his deathbed in 1990 at the age of 64. It was a poignant moment of closure and an ode to the enduring connection they had forged. Thanks for watching. Click on the videos on your screen for more content.